In this episode of the Want to Learn podcast, I'm going to be talking about the Bitcoin stock to flow model. And you're probably wondering yourself if you're following my channel a lot and you know that I talk a lot about travel, you're probably wondering why is Francis talking so much about Bitcoin recently? Well, part of the reason is there's something called the halving that's coming up in about a week's time. It's going to happen on May 11th of 2020. And that is a seminal event that happens only once every four years in the Bitcoin universe. And that effectively is when the reward that the miners get gets cut in half. So it's going to go from 12 and a half to six and a quarter. This is a big event because the supply gets constricted. And as a result, it has some dynamic effect often on the price and the value and the proposition of Bitcoin. The second thing is that I think that travel is going to be transformed much in the same way that when we went from traveler's checks, traveler's checks was a important impact on the travel industry when they first were introduced. It didn't, it, it meant that people didn't have to bring a ton of cash with them that could be stolen. If they were stolen, it was not a big deal. Then came credit cards and debit cards. That was a big transformation as well. So now Bitcoin will come down the pipe and also have another dynamic effect on the travel industry. And also I get all the time this question of like, how can you afford to travel nonstop and be a nomad nonstop? I would love to do that. I tell a lot of people, well, it's about how you invest your money. And so therefore part of this is tips to invest in your money and to try to understand Bitcoin, which I think is going to have an important uh, impact and no financial advice here, but it is a wonderful investment in my opinion. But again, it's not financial advice. Okay, so now we're going to talk about something that's a bit esoteric. It's called the stock to flow model. And it's a guy from the Netherlands whose name is Plan B. And he proposed about a year ago a model that basically said that the price of Bitcoin moves in tandem with its stock to flow ratio. Stock to flow ratio is comes from the gold industry and the silver industry and other metal mining industries where you look at the amount of existing above the ground stock how much you exactly have on the planet right now easily accessible relatively easily accessible and then how much new gold or new metal is being mined that year and so you compare the amount of new mining production compared to the existing stock and in fact, you can actually apply it to wheat and other products, basically almost anything you can apply it to, but it's we're looking at it mainly as a monetary issue with regard to Bitcoin. What Plan B noticed, which was I thought was pretty ingenious, is that the stock to flow ratio of Bitcoin has been rising. And as it has been rising, so has the price. And it's been going in a kind of an eerie lockstep pattern. So he posited that this trend could very well continue. And if so, it has huge implications on the price. What kind of implications? Well, he predicts then 2020, if the model is correct, the price of Bitcoin will go at its current value, which is roughly around $9,000 per Bitcoin as I'm recording this, to $55,000 per Bitcoin. And he predicts that in the year 2024, according to his cross asset model, which is his latest model that he just put out about a week ago, that it's going to go to a value of 288,000 roughly. And a lot of people are excited about this model, primarily because it has proven to be so predictive in the past. So what I want to do in an article, I wrote a long article explaining why this model actually will fail. Since nobody likes to read, I'm going to do a short video about those eight different reasons why I believe the stock to flow model has serious flaws and why it's ultimately doomed. So here are the eight reasons. And I'm going to be taking these reasons from the least important to the most important reasons as to why the stock to flow model is flawed. Reason number eight, we don't know exactly what gold's stock to flow ratio really is. In fact, there's quite a bit of debate about it. There's this guy named Phil Barton who made a study and he did a lot of investigation and concluded that gold stock to flow ratio is not around the 60s, which a lot of analysts believe it is. Some people say as low as 55 or so, but it's nowhere near there. He says it could be as high as 400 or 800. The stock to flow model 
says that Bitcoin in the year 2024 will hit a stock to flow ratio of 55. So very close to gold and that it will soon bypass gold. Well, it won't bypass gold anytime soon if the stock to flow of gold is 800. I explained in the article why he believes it's 800, but basically it has to do with the fact that he believes that there was a lot more gold collected in the early days of humanity, in the prehistory days than we ever anticipated. Number seven, the stock to flow ratio of gold is not fixed. If you look at the stock to flow model, you'll see that Bitcoin stock to flow is graphed over time and you'll see that it progressively gets higher and higher and higher over time. Meanwhile, on that same graph, plan B shows that gold is just this kind of fixed point. He puts it right around 60 something and, and then he puts silver around 22 or so and they're kind of fixed on the graph. But in reality, they're not fixed. If you look at the stock to flow ratio for the last 120 years, you'll see that it has this nice wavy pattern. It goes from as low as 40, about 40, 45, all the way up to 90 stock to flow, and it's kind of fluctuating. So stock to flow of, of gold is not fixed by any means. Number six, the stock to flow ratio does not drive gold's price. One of the assumptions that the stock to flow model for Bitcoin is, is that the stock to flow influences the price. Well, as we just saw, the stock to flow has been going up and down, up and down, up and down throughout the last 120 years. So therefore, if the model is correct, you would expect that the price would kind of mimic it and go up and down, up and down in the same kind of more or less pattern. But guess what? It doesn't. It doesn't do that. There's very little correlation. It's kind of tough to see that in the nominal value of gold because gold didn't float freely in the United States until 1971 when Nixon released the controls. But prior to that, we do know about the inflation rate and we can see what gold was. If it was gold at $35, $35 an ounce, we can see what inflation was. So even then, gold value was fluctuating in a way that was sometimes asymmetrical to what the stock to flow ratio was doing. So in a certain year when the stock to flow was very high, the price of gold was relatively low and then vice versa. So it, there's no causal relationship. And that shows from the fact that most gold traders don't talk about the stock to flow ratio when they're trying to predict next year's price of gold or the year after that. It, they're not obsessed about this. It's not a statistic that they care too much about. So if they don't care too much about it, why should we in the Bitcoin world? The fifth problem is that some metals have a much lower stock to flow ratio and yet a much higher price than gold. So again, this notion in the stock to flow model that we're all buying into is that a high stock to flow means high price. But if you look at platinum and palladium, these are stock to flows of one and a half compared to gold. Remember gold is around 65. So they're talking about one and a half, sometimes half, so 0.5 for palladium and for platinum. And yet guess what? The price per ounce or per kilogram, whatever you want to use, is higher for palladium and platinum than gold. That's right. Gold, pound for pound, kilo for kilo, palladium and platinum is often priced at a higher price than gold. And so again, kind of wondering, well, where is this correlation? Now, some people say, oh, no, no, wait, 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 wait. You know, pal palladium and platinum have a low, st low stock to flow ratio. The whole point of looking at gold as its stock to flow ratio is the fact that it's a monetary metal. Because it has such a high stock to flow ratio, it could be used and it has been used as a monetary device. You cannot use platinum and palladium because the stock is not is not as dependable and it's not as solid. So as a result, you can't use that. You would have a, a price that would swing too much. I understood, but people will say, well, like wheat, wheat has a low stock to flow ratio and therefore uh, that shows why gold is worth more than wheat. Well, <laughs> it doesn't work in this case. Number four, the stock to flow model of Bitcoin doesn't explain other shit coins. Shit coins are also called alternative cryptocurrencies. You have many, many alternative crypto coins, probably over a thousand different cryptocurrencies out there. 
And I haven't investigated them all, but I can probably guarantee you that some of them have stock to flow ratios that are much lower than Bitcoin. And some of them probably have stock to flow ratios that are higher than Bitcoin. And yet, as we all know, most cryptocurrencies are worth very little, certainly compared to Bitcoin. Why doesn't the model work for them? It should work for everybody, or at least most people, most cryptocurrencies, but it doesn't. Number three, and this is when things start to get pretty serious. A lot of people have pointed out that the Achilles heel of the stock to flow model is the fact that the demand is just assumed. And stock to flow just looks at, guess what? Stock, which is just the supply. You can't just look at a supply of an item. That's economics 101. You have to know the demand of an item and compare it to the supply. And that's how an economist can kind of guess at what the price is going to be. But if we only look at the supply, that's like looking at only half the equation. And so the stock to flow model kind of assumes that this kind of vibrant exponential demand that we've had in Bitcoin in the last 10 years will continue as the stock to flow marches up. And that I'm not so sure. And that brings us to the second big problem that we have with the stock to flow model is the fact that it underestimates the powers that be. In other words, it underestimates how these entrenched powers, government, regulators, banks, um, businesses, gold fans, all sorts of different entities will not be happy that Bitcoin is disrupting their industry. So they will do everything they can to slow down Bitcoin's path. And I'm not suggesting by any means, and I don't believe that they will destroy Bitcoin or end it, but they will certainly make its growth more difficult. If they ban Bitcoin in many countries, or if they put all sorts of regulations on it, it will shy away, quote unquote, less adventurous people from buying into Bitcoin. They'll be like, oh God, it's illegal. I'm not going to do that. And so as a result, the adoption rate is going to slow down. So far, it hasn't been a big deal. And that's because when Bitcoin went from a market capitalization of $1 million to $100 million, that's a tenfold increase. But on the grand scheme of things, it's not a big deal. But if it's going to go from $100 billion, which it's a little bit more than that right now, if it's going to grow 100 times, that means it's going to become a $10 trillion market cap. That's the same as gold. The gold market is $9 trillion. So Bitcoin would be $10 trillion. Now, all of a sudden, that's serious business. And that's all of a sudden when the very big, powerful entities, the FBI, the CIA, everybody, everybody who's going to be impacted by this and the whole financial industry, the insurance companies, they're all going to say, whoa, we got to stop this Bitcoin train because it's ruining my business. And that's going to be hard to fight against. And it's going to slow down Bitcoin. They're going to put up a bunch of roadblocks. Probably won't stop it. You can't kill it. It's like the internet. You can't turn off the internet. And now we come to the number one reason why the stock to flow model will finally fail. It defies physics. What do I mean by that? If you look at any organism or organization, you're going to see that if it experiences exponential growth, it eventually will become an S-curve. Eventually it has to top out. Nothing in nature can go doubling on forever. And Bitcoin will reach that critical mass soon where it's going to have to start going into an S-curve and start to slow down its growth. Otherwise, we're going to run into some serious issues. In the year 2050, for example, it's supposed to be worth $1 trillion. Not the entire ecosystem, but just one single Bitcoin would be worth $1 trillion. Now, assuming that between now and 2050, the economy grows 10 times, which of course, I don't think the global economy, which is right now almost a $100 trillion economy worldwide, if it goes up 10 times, you're still going to have Bitcoin the market capitalization be a thousand times greater than the entire world economy, which of course makes absolutely no sense. So it's got to break long before that happens. Another issue is that we're going to have to become a type one civilization. We're going to have to invent nuclear fusion in order for Bitcoin to reach the upper heights that it's aiming for, according to the stock to flow model. Because Bitcoin consumes a lot of energy. As the price goes up, its energy consumption goes up. So far, it hasn't been a crazy big problem because 
it's been using renewable energy because it's been using energy that's excess energy somewhere in the Arctic that nobody really needs or cares for. And yet there's plentiful geothermal and hydroelectric energy out there. Great. I understand that. But if Bitcoin's going to keep doubling for 30 years, doubling, 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 then in that case, it's going to need double the amount of energy, double the amount of energy. And that is going to cause a big problem. So we need to have a lot more energy because once Bitcoin starts to infringe on the energy needs of regular people and businesses, then all of a sudden that's going to drive the energy prices up higher and that is going to create a problem. And that's when they're going to want to stop Bitcoin, tax it or do whatever they can to slow down its growth. Or Bitcoin will have to change its model to use that energy in a more productive way. For example, doing folding, if you guys know what folding is, finding cures for cancer and and, and modeling proteins, etc. Now, there might be one scenario where the stock to flow model actually works. This is how it could work. If the dollar collapses, if it's no longer the reserve currency of the world, and if it starts to hyperinflate, then suddenly all the models start to work. In fact, they could even be conservative. That's because you're going to have to spend a million dollars just to get a loaf of bread in a hyperinflationary economy. That's what happens in hyperinflation. I saw it in Zimbabwe. You can see it in other places of the world right now where it's hyperinflating. You're going to have to spend millions of dollars. We're all assuming when we do all these price predictions that the United States dollar will continue to grow at an inflation rate of anywhere be less than 5% per year. Everybody assumes that. But what if all of a sudden it doesn't? What if all of a sudden it has to grow at a hyperinflationary point? Well, then all of a sudden predicting a trillion dollar Bitcoin that's no big deal. That's no prediction. <laughs> that's going to be easy to achieve. So that's the one caveat. We're, we should, when we're making all these assumptions, say that we're assuming that the inflation rate of the dollar is going to be less than 5%. Now check out this rainbow chart. I love the rainbow chart because you'll see these color bands that follow a logarithmic regression, but are otherwise completely arbitrary and without any scientific basis. This is what the creator says. He says, in other words, it will only be correct until one day it isn't anymore. And I love that. I think you could say the same thing about the stock to flow model. Look at this correlation. It's fantastic. It's beautiful. It looks all nice and pretty. And guess what? One day it will no longer be right. And that's all we should take away from it. Now, Plan B said something interesting with Peter McCormack and the What Bitcoin Did podcast, where he said, all models are wrong, but some are useful. He quoted somebody else when he said that. And he also said, I'd rather be roughly right than exactly wrong. So I don't think he thinks he has high expectations that this will be forever right. He says, quote, I'd be happy if it would only forecast the next halving or the next two halvings correctly. That would be very useful. And true, it would be very useful. Unfortunately, I don't think it's going to do that for all the reasons I just stated. So I predict that there will be a 70% chance that the stock to flow model will fail this year in its prediction of reaching $55,000 in 2020. That's going to require it to go up about six times in about seven months, which I just don't think is going to happen this year. It also says that in 2024, it's going to be 288,000. I think there's a 95% chance that that will also be wrong. I hope I'm wrong, but I think it's going to be wrong. For the last two years, I've had this little tradition of predicting the price of Bitcoin, and I've actually been surprisingly right. I've even been stunned by the predictions being right. So I don't think I'll keep that up. I'm not going to be three for three, but my prediction of this year, 2020, I said at the beginning of this year, it would reach over 10,000 and that there was a 30% chance that it was going to reach over 20,000 this year. And I still think that that's possible in both cases. But 55,000? Uh-uh. I also predicted that it will hit $100,000 a year, $100,000 per Bitcoin by the year 2030. So by the end of this decade. Now, those who are fans of Tim Draper, who said a quarter million dollars in 2024, or those who believe in the stock to flow model, which believe that it's going to be $50 million by the end of this decade, you guys are all going to be laughing at my $100,000 prediction. But for the rest of the world who actually don't know much about Bitcoin, just think it's a crazy currency and a crazy asset that's going to go to zero, they're laughing at me. <laughs> 
I picked 100,000 mainly because I thought, okay, what's an impressive appreciation rate for this decade considering how big Bitcoin already is? And I thought 14 times growth would be pretty impressive. And that's why I predicted 14 times growth. Because most assets go only about to, did they double or triple in value in a decade? That's decent. So 14 times is a pretty amazing return. The whole prediction market is kind of crazy, and so always take it with a great grain of salt. You'll see predictions about everything out there, and most of them are wrong. And it's very hard to know who's right and who's right consistently, too. With that, tell me what you guys think about the stock-to-flow model. Do you think it's the best thing? Is it accurate? Is it going to be accurate? What about my predictions? What about my analysis? Do you agree with it? Disagree with it? Put some comments down below. Send me an email at ft at francistapon.com. Subscribe to my channel. Go to wanderlearn.com. Like and review this. And this is Francis Tapon encouraging you to wander and learn. And that concludes this episode of the Wander Learn podcast, where we explore travel, technology, and transformation. If you'd like to see the show notes with links to what we talked about, or if you'd like to comment on the show, or if you'd like to ask me a question, then go to wanderlearn.com and click on this episode. If you'd like to connect with me, just remember FTAPON. That's my first initial and my last name. FTAPON is the username I use on all social media. You can also get to my website by going to ftapon.com. And here's one last reason to remember FTAPON. If you like what I do and would like to get rewarded for supporting my projects, then go to patreon.com slash FTAPON. That's where you can pick up some remarkable rewards for as little as $2 a month. And now for five quick favors. Number one, subscribe to the Wander Learn podcast. Two, download it. Three, share it. Four, review it somewhere. And five, sign up for my newsletter at wanderlearn.com. Our theme music was composed by Eric Stratman. This is Francis Tapon encouraging you to wander and learn.